All right, guys, today we are back with the FN FAL. Now, this looks a little bit different than the last time you guys saw it. And today, as the title of the video explains or kind of entails, we are going to be going over the lessons learned from modernizing an FN FAL. Now, I have done videos previously about this particular rifle configuration and platform before, but before we get into it, for those who haven't watched the channel and haven't seen this gun before, this right here is, of course, a DS Arms SA58. Now this is um, DS Arms kind of retooled version, but DS Arms, for those who are unaware, uses the same tooling uh, from FN that FN used to make the FN FAL back in the day. So this is made on original tooling. Um, so essentially these are FN FALs. Now, in addition to that, like so this is an SA58. This is the OSW or Operations Specialist Weapon version of this, and typically OSW versions of of the SA-58s include just modernized features, kind of improvements or quality of life features, such as the pick rail dust cover or kind of upper cover here that adds a pick rail to the top of the gun. In addition to this too, you get a um, kind of quad rail up front. Now the newest um, OSWs do come with M-lock rails, but essentially either way you slice it, it is a modernized rail to give you the ability to mount things such as forward grips, to mount things like flashlights, uh, lasers. Of course, I put some rail covers on here to help because anyone with time spent with quad rails know that these things are extremely abrasive and will kind of just have a saw effect on everything. They just rip everything up. So I did that, um, but yeah, so like I said, a little bit's changed the core principles of this gun are pretty much the same. Um, another thing that's kind of um, it, it kind of unique to the OSWs is you do have, of course, the ability to, or there's an AR buffer tube here that allows you to mount AR-styled stocks. So that's another nice feature of this. And of course, lastly, I do have a 30-round magazine in here. So these are a little bit bigger than the typical FNFAL 20-round 308 magazine. So. Aside from that though, this is at the core, like I said, a standard FNFAL or SA-58. Now, things that make, so that's kind of the core premise to it. Now let's talk about some of the lessons I learned in modernizing in FNFAL. So first off, um, originally, if once again, for those people who have been around the channel, you guys will remember, I had a primary arms micro prism on here and I really did like the micro prism for this rifle because it was small, it was lightweight. However, the problem with a prism optic, whether it's something like an ACOG, whether it's something like a micro prism from primary arms, they all have very finicky um, eye relief. So essentially what that means is that the sight has to be really far um, or really close to you and this just is suboptimal. So I ended up going over to an LPVO and uh, the one that I chose in particular was a SIG <clears throat> Tango MSR and these are not the nicest or the greatest but I also want you guys to keep in mind that you know I'm gonna be doing videos more than likely on the you know cheaper LPVOs um, and why they make sense but in my opinion once again you know with something like a FNFAL these guns are not necessarily inaccurate but these are minute of man typed rifles these are not sub MOA precision semi-automatic rifles and so when it comes down to scope choices. Um, this is not going to be like the most insanely accurate rifle platform. So in my opinion, um, and from my experience, I really don't dislike having a, you know, lesser quality um, LPVO on here because once again, this rifle is not some, you know, super precision typed rifle. This is a minute of man rifle. So for what this scope gives you in accuracy, I feel like this rifle itself is capable in delivering. This is not a super crazy accurate rifle. So you're not going to get crazy performance. Now, the biggest reason why I moved over to the LPVO, I do like the ability to adjust your, you know, magnification, be able to zoom in and 
like be able to see things more clearly. That does indeed help. But the biggest thing that I like about it most of all is the eye relief on most of your LPVOs because they are still an etched reticle to, um, optic. They are still going to give you that nice feature of not needing batteries to function such as a you know red dot, but they are still a nice etched reticle. But the eye relief on most, if not all LPVOs is far more generous than a fixed prism optic. So what this means is you can have that scope a little bit further forward, a little bit further away from you. And more importantly, if you want to actually adjust your stock out and actually get a larger um, length of pull, you can do that. So that was something that I was really running into with the um, prism is that I had to be very close to the optic and I had to be really down on it. And it was very much suboptimal for what I was trying to do actually in practice. So I unfortunately had to move away from the prism. I do like the prism for simplicity and especially for weight because these guns, even with the shorter barrel, this is a 12.5 barrel, um, you know, even with the shorter barrel, the, this is still a pretty hef hefty rifle coming in at about 11 pounds empty. So, you know, when you throw something that's like a pound of optic on here, a pound of glass, you are pushing this rifle into some pretty hefty territory. But once again, to, act, to actually functionally use it, something like an LPVO it makes a lot of sense. Now, another issue that I ran into in practice, actually running this gun, shooting it, doing some running gun practice, um, was sling placement. So the sling placement originally, um, I'll talk about a little bit. I originally had the sling mounted up here towards the top of the gas block, essentially, as you guys can see here. So I originally had the sling mounted up here towards the gas block, and that wasn't so much of a problem with, uh, with the sling placement, but the biggest issue came that I originally had the sling mounted back here on the stock, as you guys can see. And so what ended up happening, or what ended up becoming an issue, is as you're working reloads and drills, so you know, boom, boom, you got to reload. When you have that sling back here, it really binds and jams up your gun's functionality to get the gun leveled like this to reload. And this is especially important with guns like FALs, like AKs, any type of system where you have to rock in and out magazines. In my opinion, when you're doing reloads, it needs to be up here at your plane of sight. So you guys can see, you know, I'm looking directly in front of me. I'm not looking at my magazine reloads. I'm looking directly in front of me, but this is in my focal vision or not so much focal, but my uh, peripheral vision. So I can still see what I'm doing because this isn't like a um, AR-15 where you just hit a button and the magazine falls out. You do need to like actually at least partially visualize what you're doing here because of the rock motion and so for me um, having your gun up at your like I said up into your like a vision area your plane of where you're working is very important now I do also do this with a lot of my ARs too it's definitely good practice but being able to have it here means that I had to adjust my sling mount so I'll show you guys where I put the sling on the FNFAL to make it far more functional so I put the upper portion right here right in front of the charging handle. Now, at first, some people may think, you know, that that blocks or obstructs this charging handle. And in certain instances it can, but if you're actually wearing the sling, like you should be if you are shooting this rifle, um, I really haven't found it to block the charging handle that much. And then the biggest one is moving the rear sling mount. So what I did was, of course, as I stated earlier, um, with the OSW models, they give you the ability to move over to these AR-15 buffer tube um, styles of stocks and so what that gives you the ability to do is put a sling mount um, sling swivel that goes on the buffer tube so that's what I did I did have to get a little bit creative with mine and I kind of had to shave some parts of it down to get it to fit on here but I got it to fit on here and as you guys can see it has mobility it moves and uh, yeah it, it does what it needs to do and most importantly when your rear sling point is back here it gives you that ability that when you come up with the rifle that that sling doesn't interfere with your ability to reload and so that was the big thing for me is I needed to be able to have this rifle like set up in my working space and be able to reload it without a problem. So that's what I had to do with the sling. And once again, you know, like FALs 
are outdated platforms, their weapon system user interface is not as streamlined or as nice as something like an AR-10 or an AR-15. So these are kind of learning curves as a whole. So lastly, um, yeah, so overall, that was kind of my experience with the gun. Now, a few kind of notes too is that other things, if you do plan to run things like red dots on these guns and you want to co-witness with your iron sights, just note that the iron sights on an FNFAL, as you can see, are extremely low. So being able to actually co-witness, even with a red dot, would be functionally impossible because essentially, hopefully you guys can kind of see here with how high my head is. If I'm aiming through my scope, I essentially have a cheek weld on the rifle, which is pretty comfortable, especially with the STR stock, which is part of the reason why I got the STR stock is because with FALs, they like they have an older interface. So essentially any type of optic you mount um, is going to have some form of a, a mount on it. So it's going to raise it. So you're going to be stuck with essentially a cheek weld, whereas the bone stock um, iron sights are very low. So if I was to actually try to look through the iron sights I would be down here so you guys can see that's where my iron sights would be that's where I am with the scope so pretty big difference you're not going to be able to really get a um, co-witness unfortunately unless you mounted aftermarket iron sights which would technically be possible it would just look very very weird because you can still very clearly see both iron sights but the iron sights are very low on the FNFAL um, other things to this um, I would highly recommend running something like a bipod or a VF G. I have a vertical foregrip here and even as the more I shoot this or the more I shoot this gun the more I'm like a bipod is really not a horrible um, way to go except probably on these uh, smaller OSW models because this has such a short barrel to it such a small reasonably compact rifle so I continue to run a VFG on it and you really want that because once again the recoil impulse just like everything else is a little bit dated so it's not as streamlined line you're going to be feeling the recoil impulse pretty well um, and that is by no means a bad thing this gun for being a 12 pound 308 it is actually pretty pretty darn soft shooting you know like it's it's a heavier 308 so 308 is definitely not a slouch when it comes to recoil but this gun also is hefty so it soaks a lot of the recoil up but I think the big thing for me the reason why I like the bipods and VFGs on these is really like I said that 12 pounds when you're sitting there holding it it starts to weigh down on you so the nice part about having a VFG is you can either use this to prop it up, kind of like a monopod, rest on things like trucks, like different supports around your surroundings, or once again, it gives you that ability to really push this gun back into your shoulder, really give it some good tension and lock, and uh, also correspond with your uh, sling to get some additional tension in there. So for me, that is essentially the big lessons learned. Another thing, some people are going to point it out. Um, I, a lot of people say I mounted my scope backwards or my scope cantilever scope mount backwards. And I did indeed do this, but I did this intentionally because once again, big fan of running slings. And so if you guys notice, at least with the SIG MSR cantilever mounts, these are some really huge uh, nuts on this guy and so what i wanted was that i know that when this thing is slung it's up against my body and these nuts are very painful so if you're doing any run and gun stuff um, having these large protruding nuts are they're going to drive into your sternum at least if you're right-handed like i am you know these would drive into your sternum it'd be very uncomfortable however the other side of this is flush fitting so you can see the other side of this mount is flush fitting so i intentionally put this um Cantilever, uh, cantilever mount backwards on the rifle so that I could have this without these large protruding nuts just stabbing into my chest. So there is that, um, but it is intentionally done for that reason and uh, yeah so for those people wondering it does look a little awkward when you look at it like that scope mount definitely looks backwards it is indeed backwards but I set it up entirely backwards for that reason so that I don't have these large nuts jamming into my body so yeah there is that um, but aside from that that's basically everything that I've learned from this guy overall 
would I buy it again? Personally, in my opinion, um, I would definitely buy the FAL again, but that is also partly because I have that second kind of cool factor with the FNFAL. I think this is a very cool platform. Um, definitely dated, definitely old school. This is not like, you know, high speed, low drag. I mean, this, you know, modernized setup is good, but it's definitely not without its flaws, things like the safety. And once again, having to rock in your magazines, you know, it's definitely not like the most high speed, low drag gun. If you are really looking for a super serious, super tactical typed um, 308 platform, just go with an AR-10. But if you are looking for an FNFAL, if they scratch that kind of second kind of cool itch with you, um, you know, it's hard to go wrong with that kind of setup. And uh, yeah, this is definitely the way I would recommend setting one up if you want it to be, I don't know if I would say competitive, but semi-competitive with other contenders. Once again, contending with things like the AR-10s of the world, the SCAR Hs of the world. This is going to be the best way to really make this gun, like I said, the most useful of it possibly being. Now, if you're going for, you know, that kind of historical LARP status, you know, I would say go get the, you know, like Rhodesian FAL, you know, go get it painted um, in those types of camouflage patterns. Like if you're going for the historical standpoint of the FNFAL, um, definitely go for that. But if you are wanting an FNFAL, you think they're cool. And that's where I found myself. I just think that this weapon platform is cool. I've always loved the FNFAL platform. It's just a neat Neat, neat gun. It has a lot of really cool history. And so I wanted that, but I also wanted to make it as competitive realistically with its contenders. Once again, the AR-10s, the Scar Hs and such as possible. And so that's what I looked at doing with this build. And so like I said, chosen OSW because it has the full quad rail on it, has the you know um, upper dust cover or whatever you want to call cover that has pick on it. Um, it has all those features, all those bells and whistles. So that is what I liked about it the most. And uh, overall, I think that the platform came out as good as it can. And hopefully um, you guys have learned from my mistakes, my lessons. And uh, like I said, ultimately, this is basically the way I would recommend anyone setting up a you know near peer styled FNFAL for 2024 would be. Of course, if you're wanting to run, you know, lasers, IR, stuff like that, you know, have packs on here, D balls, whatever. Um, you certainly, there's still even to this point, you know, tons of rail space on here. Um, and you could get rid of the flashlight, put, you know, a Surefire Vampire on there. So there's definitely options for making this a little bit more modern, but the big thing I would say is definitely watch your weight with any attachments that you add because your base rifles already starting off at 11 pounds and it's only going to get heavier from there. And I'd say the only other thing is, you know, be realistic with your accuracy because like I said, that's why I throw it through a Tango MSR on here. Um, you can certainly go out and get, you know, a night force at a car. Um, and throw that on here, but realistically speaking, you know, like you, you're, there's going to be diminishing gains because you can throw a really nice, you know, loophole or Nikon or like I said, um, Night Force on here, but understand that this rifle platform, this, this weapon platform is a minute of man platform. You're not going to be doing sub MOA with this rifle. It's just not what an FNFAL was built for. These barrels are not sub, sub MOA barrels. And that still, once again, is the bat isn't a bad thing you're probably going to get realistically you know at 100 meters you're probably going to get you know two moa with this rifle which once again um you know minute of man definitely two moa is good enough for a lot of things um and especially with a barrel this short um i i went into this rifle once again choosing this osw with the shorter barrel knowing that this is not a long range precision platform now can you get hits out to 800 meters with this rifle absolutely Absolutely, you definitely can. Um, Nine Hole Reviews has done videos um, previously, you know, where they showcase that you can get hits once again on man-sized targets out to 800 meters with FNFALs. They're not like inaccurate. Once again, I'm not saying like you definitely don't want to be shot at by one of these guys, but they're also not a high, high precision, you know, bolt gun 308. This is not going to be, you know, your um, Christensen Arms um, modern precision rifle in 308. 
weight. Like this is not going to beat that. Okay. This is totally different. Um, and yeah, the, the use in design application is totally different as well, because you're not going to see a modern precision rifle with a 30 round, uh, FAL magazine in it either. So keep, keep that in mind, take it for what it's worth. Um, that's kind of my overall experiences with the FNFAL, how I configured mine, how I got it to be a, like I said, contender, things such as your scar h's your um ar 10s that such thing so like i said this is what i got and i still really like it i think it's really cool um definitely not bad and definitely does the trick very well so my opinion overall pretty good platform and pretty happy with how it turned out anyways guys hopefully you enjoyed the video hopefully you like the lessons learned and uh tell me what you guys think of this build overall in the comment section below